Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father, as we uh, gather here this morning, we uh, know that you are the author and finisher of our faith, and this morning we look for our faith to be increased. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it doesn't take much. You even said faith is a mustard seed, which is the smallest of seeds, can move a mountain. And this morning we look uh, to you through Izzy to open your word to our minds, to our hearts, that we might grow more and Allow us to be closer to you, more like you, be able to share the good news of the gospel with those around us. Bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh, thank you, Dave. Well, guys, would you grab your Bibles and turn to Romans 12, 14 this morning? We're going to pick up and do the last paragraph of this entire chapter. And I know that we've been going verse by verse And it's only taken, what, four or five weeks to do three verses. So you're going to go into shock today at the speed I take you through the last part of the chapter. But the the portion we covered, to me, from Romans 12, 9 to to 13, is just one paragraph. But it was the paragraph about how we're to love without hypocrisy. The step-by-steps that we do that show that we truly are... Um, you know, genuine believers. There's nothing worse than a phony believer. I mean, I don't know if you've ever run into them, but I guess it's an occupational hazard as a pastor. We, we have them cross our path quite frequently. And, and you know, they, they, this is great instruction of how we live with that genuine faith, that real faith that just shows Christ in our actions, in our behaviors. And, and now today we come to the last paragraph of Romans 12, And Paul is going to put down something that is truly, I believe, the attitude we have to have when it comes to living out this love without hypocrisy. I mean, there's a a genuine attitude that is maybe something more, I don't know if the attitude is even the right word. You guys will have to help me with this. I've been trying to grow up for what's the right word for this that, because at the end, the very end line of of this chapter, he says that we should not be overcome by evil but instead we overcome evil with what with good now let me show you what he leads up to that idea with he says this starting in verse 14 bless those that persecute you he says bless and do not curse so we're instructed to bless the people that persecute us i mean i don't know about you but when someone persecutes you do you feel like blessing them you know oh i bless you that you fall into a hole today or something i mean (laughs) I mean, I don't, that's not, that's a Sicilian way, but that's not really a blessing, you know. Here he says, bless those that persecute you, bless and curse not. Now these are really sound instructions, and he goes on, and I I have to read all the way to the end before I can come back and explain these, because you have to see it in the context what he gives it. Let me read it to you. Verse 15, he goes on to say, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind, it says, with one another. And do not be haughty. You know, don't be, um, what was in English, stuck up? You know, when the person puts the nose in the air like I'm better than you all? He says, do not be like that. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. And do not be wise, he says, in your own estimation. How many folks do you think there are that think they're the wisest thing on the planet? I mean, I don't know why, but they all seem to be attracted to me to tell me that I don't have enough wisdom, and they're certainly more wise than I am. And You know, he says, don't be wise in your own estimation. And then he goes on to say, and never pay back evil for evil to anyone. He said, respect what is right in the sight of all men, and if possible, so far as it depends on you, he says, be at peace with all men. Thank God he said, so far as, you know, it, it depends on you, because some of us aren't so peaceable at times. But he I know what he's saying, I just got to do it. He says, so if possible, be at peace with all men. And verse 19, and this is something I was not raised with. I'm just confessing, when you're raised in a Sicilian home, you are not taught this line. 
It says right here, never take your own revenge. Sicilians pride themselves in how to plot revenge. I mean, we go to sleep thinking about what we're going to do to get them back. And we wake up plotting, okay, now I could do this or that. Or, and it, it, it's, it, you know, it's just a little art form. I mean, I hate to say it, but it's like literally taught to us from our youth. And, you know, you think you came up with a good plan until you talk to your uncle. CEO, who's been doing this a lot longer, and he's, he's going, that's an amateur revenge move. Let me tell you what you really need to do, you know. And it's horrible. But it's all teaching of how to take your own revenge. And when I read this, I almost choked. It says never, never. This doesn't say sometimes you might not want to take your own revenge. It says never. Anyone notice that? Never means when. Never. Never, never take your I'm like, gulp. Beloved, but leave room, it says. Now, here is the only way I can swallow this pill. It says, but leave room for what? For the wrath of God. For it is written, it says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I will repay. But if your enemy is hungry, he says, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. And in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Now, when I read this in the context, now, I, I, you know, last week I was so blessed. One of the sisters came up at the end of the study and goes, I was reading ahead in the verse about, you know, um, you heap burning coals on there. I don't get that. So that's really good. Th this is from the Proverbs, by the way. This is Proverbs 25, if you want to look with me at it. I'd like to show you this verse in its context. Now, Proverbs, you remember, is a collection of wise sayings and and this is the this one is from the proverbs of solomon it says what hezekiah had translated the king of judah he had him transcribed what the writings were of solomon so the guy telling this is solomon and he, and, and when, so you know he's this is the son of who who's solomon's dad do you remember david I, I'll, I'll bring this all together in a minute but let me show you what he says he says verse 21 he says, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head. And this part, I don't know why Paul stopped where he did. That's where he stops his quote when he's telling it in Romans. But the last line, I love the last line of verse 22. Proverbs 25, 22 says, and the Lord will reward you. You go, what? I mean, he says here, if your enemy is hungry. What are you supposed to do for him? Feed him. If he's thirsty, what are you supposed to do? Get him to drink. If it, 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 he says, for in so doing, you heap burning coals on his head. Now, when I first read this as a new Christian, I was like, oh, that's a burn, you know, because we, we used to like, we used to use this term in high school, you know, when somebody did something and they used a sharp word to cut the other guy down. Oh, what a burn, man. He got him, you know, and, we were like, yeah, and, and I was thinking, so this is the way you burn them, you know? You heap burning coals on their head by, when they're hungry, you give them food, and when they're thirsty, you give them what? Something to drink? I mean, uh, you're helping them. I didn't know the Middle Eastern culture, what it was really saying, when you give the, the burning coals to them on the head. The, in their culture, you, you ever see over in the Middle East how they have these these folks that they can carry, I don't even know how they do it. They put, they put something on their head and they like can have a pot of water, weighs like 40 pounds, and they'll be just walking along like do 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 do. And they just they carry stuff unbalanced on the head. And they even will carry the the tray, the the pan with the fire pan on which, which I thought I was watching this. It's Cody and this other guy, the army guy, and they're doing the survival show and they're trying to show that, you know, once you get the fire made, you got to save the fire because they're in the rainforest. So they put some into a little tube they made out of a bamboo. And, and he's going, we got to carry this and keep this fire alive because this is the only fire we had. We had to destroy the one battery he had with the one piece of foil that we sparked and made the little thing. You know, they're showing the survival techniques. So the guy is carrying the bamboo and he's got it in a sling over his shoulder. And the bamboo tube is green, but... They hike for all day, and you know what happens with the back of his... I mean, his, his shirt actually catches fire 
on the back because it burns through the, the bottom of the bamboo and starts catching him on fire. And I'm thinking, this is not really that wise. You know, and besides that, the whole time he's hiking, he keeps complaining about the smoke that keeps wafting over his shoulder and choking him. And I'm thinking, in the Middle East, what they do is they put the tray up on the head, right? And they put, the, they, they put this little cloth, like a little, wind it up like a little round ring, like a, kind of like a cloth crown, I'll call it. And they put this clay tray right on top. And they put the coals right here and carry the fire and... Guess where the smoke goes? Up, right? So you walk all day and not choke on the smoke. And, and you, was, you could do this in a way to transport the fire to your next spot and start your... They didn't have Zippos, okay? There was no, there was no big lighters back then or an easy way to start the fire. You had to, you know... But one of the things that I flip... I, I don't know why I like to watch these survival shows. I, just, I think it's because I, I laugh a lot. I think, what an idiot. But on one of the shows, they had these guys, they went out for 40 days naked. And they're going to survive this 40-day challenge. And there's groups of them. They don't know that there's another group over just over the hill, and there's another group over there. And one group has fire, and the other ones don't. They had got the fire started. And, and it came time when, in the show where they, they actually cross paths, the groups, and, and they're starting to compare notes. And the one group, they haven't eaten anything cooked for... I don't know, like 20 days or something. No fire. They could not get a fire. I'm thinking, you guys are supposed to be the survival guys. You know, I grew up in Arizona. I did Boy Scouts. Fire was like my favorite merit badge. I like learned all sorts of ways to start. I had a pyro. That's the problem is I learned all these different ways to start. But these guys, I'm thinking, you shouldn't even be on this show. So the one guy goes, can we get some fire from you? And what do they do? They get some coals and put them into a little thing and transport it over to their camp and they're all, we got to keep them alive, we got to keep them alive. And I'm watching it and I, the Lord goes, do you remember her, the thing about heaping burning coals on the head? You see how much it helped the other group? Because once the other group got the fire going, they had some stuff that just needed cooking. And they had a resource what they could get stuff to eat, but they needed it to be cooked. And all of a sudden, fire just made it like life is better. You know, there's a fire at night to warm themselves. There was a way to cook. There was a way to boil the water. All of a sudden, they're just happy as can be. We got fire. And I never really thought about, I mean, when we want fire, <laughs> we just turned a little dial on the stove. You know, we got a pilot under there. If it goes out, we get the big lighter up. You know, propane runs out. We switch to the bottle. We start over. Takes a few minutes, but, you know, fire's back. I had to do it this morning before service. All of a sudden, five in the morning, Jan's like, yes, we're out of gas. The pilot's dead. All right, I'm going. Pastoral duties for serving food in the morning. Switch the propane tanks, relight the thing. She relit it for me. So, But I, it wasn't one of those long, arduous tasks of days and days of survival with no fire. But, you know, it took that show to make me realize how Happy those people were when somebody gave them this little gift of some burning coals. I mean, they literally were, because I never thought of it in that context. Like, what if you lived in the days when it wasn't easy to start a fire? You didn't have the Bic lighters. You didn't have that convenience. You were actually, I mean, when I saw it in the context of that show, I realized those, that group that had the fire, when they gave the fire to the other guys, the other guys were so happy. You would think that they gave him, I don't know, like a million bucks or some life. You know, they're just like, oh, this is the greatest thing. We've been shivering every night. And I'm like, yeah, they really did get blessed by this simple act of giving them some coals to get their fire started. Well, in this context here in the Bible, Solomon isn't talking about giving them a burn by heaping coals on their head like I thought when I first read it. He's talking about actually helping them, giving them the ability to warm themselves, giving them the ability to cook their food. You, you're blessing them. He just said, what was the two lines before? If your enemy is hungry, what do you do? You feed him. If he's thirsty, what do you do? Give him to drink. If he's cold and shivering, you give him the coal so he can start his fire. That's what he's saying, by the way. You're this is all blessing, blessing, blessing. 
If your enemy is in a bad way, he's hungry, he's thirsty, he's cold, he's without fire, what do you do? You take care of him. You think, and what, why? Well, it says why. Solomon says it right here. And the Lord will do what? He'll reward you. So when you take care of your enemy, God sees it and will reward you. Now, in Matthew, Jesus addressed this very idea about our enemies. In chapter 5, he says this. He says in verse 43, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your enemy, uh, uh, I'm sorry, your neighbor. You shall love your neighbor. And you heard it said that you should hate your enemy. But I say to you, Jesus says, that you should love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. And so shall you be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. That was a knock, by the way, for all us non-Jewish people. Therefore, he said, you are to be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. This word perfect in Greek is the word for complete. You know, we're not really complete when we only love the people that are nice to us. We're not like our Father in heaven. We're not perfect. Because does God love all the people or just the people that love him? Oh, all. All, right? He loves all. And he tells, Jesus says, you heard you're supposed to love your neighbor, but you also say, you know, hate your enemy. Jesus says, I say to you, wrong. You, you, gotta, you have to love your enemies also. And you have to pray for them. I don't know about you, but praying for my enemies used to be the, like, I thought this is the worst spiritual assignment you could possibly get. Like, I feel like praying for them. I don't want to pray. Well, I'll pray for them. I'll pray like David. God, you smite them down. I read he did that once, so I was like, hey, I like that, you know. I don't really think that, you know, David, David actually was saying, God, you take care of the battle for me. And David, David's probably one of my best examples of this. David... He actually lives out this attitude in the Old Testament in a way, and you got to remember, the guy who wrote this whole verse about, you know, give them something to drink, give them something to eat, you know, do good to them, and the Lord's going to reward you. That's the son of David who wrote that. But David, he had some bad stuff happening to him where his, his faith was tested. He had to actually do this in practice. Well, let me show you. Turn with me to 1 Samuel 24. David was told by the prophet, you're going to be the next king. Saul has sinned. He's disobeyed the Lord. And, and God sent the prophet to Saul and said, because you didn't obey, God is going to take away the kingdom from, from you and give it to someone more righteous than you. A man who's after his own heart. And so Saul didn't, did Saul just go, oh, okay, I, I, I'll retire then. Here, I, I give you my crown. Who, here's the crown. Give it to whoever you, you see is the right guy. To the pro Did he do that to Nathan? No. He goes, who's this guy? And then what did he do when he found out who it was? It was David. He turned his whole armies, his commander-in-chief Joab, he said, go get this guy and kill him. He's a threat to my kingdom. Now, David was the one who had delivered Israel from Goliath. He's the one that they sang this song. Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his what? What were the ladies singing? His tens of thousands. He's the man, this David, you know. He's, God is with him. And Saul, man, he did not like that. So he sent his armies chasing David. And we read in, 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 in chapter 24, Saul was in pursuit. Actually, in chapter 23, I love this one. He's closing in. He's got, um, he's got David over on the hill across from him. And it says in, uh, in verse 24, then, I'm um, sorry, 1 Samuel 23, 24. 
23-24. Then they arose and they went to Ziph before Saul. And David and his men were in the wilderness of Moan in Arabah. It's to the south of Jezimon. And when Saul and his men went to seek him, they told David. And he came down to the rock and he stayed in the wilderness of, uh, uh, of Maon. And, and when Saul heard it, he pursued David into the wilderness. And Saul went on the one side of the mountain and David and his men were on the other side. Of the mountain. David, it says, was a hurrying to get away from Saul, for Saul and his men were surrounding David and his men to seize them. But a messenger came to Saul, said, Hurry, come, the Philistines have made a raid on the land. So Saul had to turn. He returned from pursuing David and went to meet the Philistines. And therefore they called that place the Rock of Escape. And David went up from there and stayed in the strongholds. Of Engedi. So right in that, we would call this um, God delivering in the very last moment, Nikit. I mean, they're on the other side, uh, you know, the valley right there. It's just a little valley. All Saul's guys are on this side, and they're, I can just picture this in my mind so easily. They're running, they're running this way to get away from him, and the other guys are on the other side of the hill, and they're just looking across at him, chasing, just running, going, we're getting you, we're getting you. And they're coming to where the valleys are going to come like this. So the canyon comes t together. David is like getting himself into a pickle. He, he is not looking good for him. And Saul's men are bearing down. And right when they're just about to get to him, one of Saul's servants comes running up, a messenger. And those messengers must have had to hustle. Because there was no phone texting or something. You know, This guy had to run, run after, a fl after an army that's Chasing a guy who's fleeing. So he must have been a really fast messenger. And he goes sprinting up there and says, Hey, excuse me, excuse me. You guys, <laughs> I can't, I'm just running along. Um, the Philistines are attacking. We got to, we got to, in the back. Saul has to whip around and turn the whole, uh, guys, turn around. Let's go get the Philistines. They're, they're, they're attacking us. And David, can you imagine being David? You look over and they're on a hot pursuit. They're just breathing down your neck. And all of a sudden, the whole group turns around and leaves. He'd be like, Whew. let's call this place the Rock of Escape. Uh, you know what rock it was. It was the Lord, our rock, that saved David in that moment. But the next chapter tells us Saul, after he took uh, returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, behold, David's in the wilderness of En Gedi. En Gedi's over there by the sides, uh, kind of overlooks down towards the, the um, Dead Sea in Israel. He's hiding up in the rocks up there. There's a little spring up in there. And Saul, it says, took 3,000 chosen men from Israel and went to seek David. Chosen means like, um, we would say, Green Berets you know, uh, army rangers, the wh whatever the toughest guys are in the military, the real seasoned, you know, bad guys. He, this is what he says, chosen men. In other words, he picked out, he handpicked the toughest, baddest dudes. He, they're chasing one guy. How many guys is he going to make sure he brings to get him? 3,000 bad guys. I mean, really trained soldiers. And he goes after David. And listen to this. I don't know how many of you know this chapter, but this is probably one of the... the I, I wonder if David ever told this story to his son Solomon. Because you wonder, where did Solomon get all this wisdom? If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, you know. Do these things. The Lord will reward you. You know, don't, 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 um, don't hurt your enemy. Help him. Where, did, where do sons learn their attitudes anyway? The majority of them. From their fathers. Listen to this story and think if you think David might have ever passed on this wisdom to his son Solomon. What happens right here in this place called En Gedi in the caves up there in the little crags of the mountain. It says that Saul took the 3,000 chosen men from Israel. He went to seek David in front of the rocks of the wild goats. It's called the rocks of the wild goats because it's like you got to be pretty much a goat to climb up there anyway. It's like real crags and and little cracks to go up in. And, and it says, he came to the sheepfolds on the way. And where there, it says, there was a cave there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. How many of you have heard this story before? 
I got in trouble for telling this story one time when I was a younger man. I'm not going to tell you why, but, well, maybe, I don't know. Tell us. Tell us. <laughs> I was telling this story. I, I got thrown in to preach for John Higgins, the pastor. His, his mom was dying back east, so he, he calls me like five minutes before service starts. You're up. And uh, 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 I'm up, you know, and we had a couple services each morning, you know, with a couple thousand people. And I'm, I'm supposed to preach. And I'm just the youth leader. And I had just taught this chapter to the kids because this chapter showed me something really cool. And so John, John always taught me, don't share what you don't know. <laughs> share what the Lord's been showing you. And I'm like, okay, my middle name is David. I like the stories about David, you know. I'm reading about David, the daily reading. So I get up and I tell this story. And I'm telling the story. Like, just, I'm a young man in the Lord. I, I, I'm just put it into contemporary terms. And it says right here, David when it, uh, is in the back of the cave and Saul went in to relieve himself. And I looked up the word relieve in Hebrew and it means to go number two, body, you know, like the bathroom. Like, um, so I went, I'm just telling this story and I'm, I'm young, okay? Just give me a lot of slack here. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm a young man and I'm telling the story and so I, I'm just preaching along, and I go, and so picture this. Saul goes in there to take a dump, and David's, David's in the back, and, and I just keep going. I, I, know, I have no idea that I just offended half of the people, the younger ones. The older ones are just laughing, thinking this kid's really into the story. And then, then I go on. I read the rest. It says, and the men of David said to him, look, behold, this day the Lord is with you. And the Lord is about to give you the hand of your enemy. Right in, he's going to give your enemy right into your hand. And you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Like, you can kill him. And I'm getting into the story. Yeah, David, you're right there. He's, he's going to the bathroom. You got him, man. His drawers are down. I mean, it's a robe. This is even better. He's either got it hiked up or dropped down. You got him. And then David arose, and I see I read ahead, it, I, it's a robe. Because you guys that read the story, you know what he did, right? He rises up, David sneaks up behind Saul, and he cuts off secretly the edge of his robe. And it came, then listen to this, it came about afterwards that David's conscience bothered him. Because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So he said to his men, far be it from me because of the, because of the Lord that I should do this thing to, the, to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. David was really the one God had anointed to be the next king already by this point. But he said, but God had that guy in first and I'm not going to raise my hand against him. So David persuaded his men with these words and, and he did not allow them to rise up against Saul. So Saul arose he left the cave, went on his way. Now, afterward, David arose and went out of the cave and called out after Saul, saying, My Lord, my King. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the ground and prostrated himself. What's that mean? What position did he take? Right on the ground, face down. This is not a good position for getting into a fight. This is saying, I am humble before you. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of the men? Behold, David seeks to harm you. Behold, this day, he says, your eyes have seen that the Lord has given you today into my hand in the cave. And some said to kill you, but my eye had pity on you. And I said, now where's he saying this from? Just, just so you know. He's not standing up hollering this at him. He's on the ground. And he's saying, my eyes had pity on you. I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for, for he is the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to take you out because God put you in. Now, my father, see. And indeed, and I can just see him, he's laying on the ground prostrate, and he holds up this little thing with a hand. See the edge of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut it off, 
from the edge of your robe and did not kill you. Know and perceive that there is no evil or rebellion in my hands. For, he says, and I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge me on you. But my hand shall not be against you. And as the Proverbs of the ancient says, out of the wicked comes forth wickedness. But my hand, he said, shall not be against you. Now, after it says, who, 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 whom has the king, he goes, after, after whom has the king come of Israel come out after? He says, whom are you pursuing? A dead dog? A single flea, he says. He's like, why are you chasing? You got the whole army chasing one guy. He goes, the Lord, therefore, be judge and decide between you and me. And may he see and plead my case and deliver me from your hand. Now, when David finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, is this your voice, my son David? Then Saul lifted up his voice and he wept. And he said to David, you are more righteous than I, for I have dealt You've dealt well with me while I dealt wickedly with you. It, it, it convicted Saul. He's like, you, you know, you, you could have killed me and you didn't. He says, you declared, he says, you've declared today that you've done good to me and that the Lord delivered me into your hand, yet you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safely? This is Saul asking the question. What do you think Saul would have done? He would have killed him. So Saul, I know Saul had to get convicted by this because he says, may the Lord therefore reward you. Ah, wait, the Lord reward you with good in return for what you have done to me this day. Now behold, I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. How did Saul know the Lord had, had rewarded David? How, what was that sign? You know, like he, he goes, I know that the Lord will reward you for this good in return for what you've done. God's going to see what you did. You did what was right, and I would have not done it. I mean, he's, I, it's obvious he wouldn't have done it. But it convicted him. He's like, and you're, you're surely more righteous than I. You're going you're gonna to be the one that gets the kingdom. Now, do you think David ever told this story to his son Solomon? How when he had the chance to kill the previously anointed guy as king to take him out and take his position, he didn't do it. He didn't raise his own hand. Instead, he let the Lord take care of the job. Saul takes his army and departs, if you read a little bit further. But ironically, you know, Paul's quoting this in Romans and saying, you don't overcome evil with evil. How do you overcome evil? We're good. I wish I could say that it works the first time. You only have to do it once. But I read ahead. You go only two more chapters to chapter 26, and guess who's chasing David again? Saul. And this time, David's got a... He's got the whole army encamped against him. But you know what? David trusted the Lord. And I love the, the chapter 26 tells the story where, where Saul's men are camped out, and they, they're... They're encamped around the king to guard him. And the Lord, I'll just summarize for you. You can read it for extra credit later. 1 Samuel 26 is great reading. This this will build your faith. Who fights for David when, when, when these guys are, are right there on, breathing on his neck, just, just about to catch up to kill him? The Lord. And the Lord does something that is so cool. He causes a deep sleep to fall over all of Saul's men and over Saul. He makes him so sleepy, they're out cold and you know what david does goes right yeah exactly right in the camp right up to the head of the king and he takes from the head of the king he just you know takes a jug of water takes his spear <laughs> takes the king's spear takes the king's personal he'd be like taking my jug gets his jug takes it away so when the king wakes up so this voice going, excuse me, Abner, Abner, this is the king's bodyguard. You're a lousy bodyguard over there. Yes, yeah, exactly what he's doing. Aren't you supposed to be protecting the king? 
How come I got his water jug? How come I got his spear? Saul, verse 21. This is chapter 26. I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will not harm you because my life was more precious in your sight this day. And behold, I played the fool and committed a serious error. Or folly, it says in the King James. He was a fool. But David, just because someone else is a fool, does that mean you've got to be a fool back? Or just because they do evil to you, do you have to return evil for their evil? The answer is no. You never win when you return evil for evil. That I did learn in Sicilian upbringing. Because once you take revenge, then you've got to worry about them taking their revenge back. And, and you've got to be careful, because if they got any family members left, it's just like, and, and they breed too, you know. That's like part of the whole deal. And once their kids grow up, then the kids will come after your kids. I mean, it's just like this ongoing craziness of revenge. Revenge doesn't ever seem to be satisfied, does it? It's like just fuels itself. And the evil begets more evil, and it just pays back evil. More evil goes the other way, then back again. And Jesus, Jesus says, you heard you're just supposed to love your neighbor. I say, you've got to pray for your enemies. You've got you to gotta love them. You've got to take care of your enemies. And Paul goes on and quotes the proverb that Solomon wrote. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, guys, I can't help it, but in the book of Kings, in 2 Kings, there's a story in chapter 6. This one I've taught before, but this is one that really touches home of how this works. It's the story where the prophet is um, Elisha, not Elijah. Elijah was the first one. If you ever forget, alphabetical order. Elijah, the second guy was Elisha. He's the one that asked for double the anointing of the first guy. And the first guy said, well, if you see me when I go, then you get double my anointing. If you don't see me, and he kept trying to send the, 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 the what do you call the protege, the guy that's coming after him, keep trying to send him, go, go, go on an errand, go do this. He goes, no way, if I go on an errand, you're going to just vanish. You know, you'll get caught up to heaven or something, and I won't get my double anointing. So he stuck to him like glue. And you guys remember when the chariots of fire took Elijah, Elijah up to heaven, that Elisha's down there going, hey, don't forget, throw me, you know, throw me your mantle. And he throws down his mantle, and he, it says Elisha, this guy, put it on, took his staff from Elijah, he threw it down, he took his staff, and he walks over to the Jordan, and he just touches the Jordan, and it parts. Was the power of God with this kid? I mean, all of a sudden, he's walking by on dry ground. The water just, you know. I mean, that's like, the, that's like when the priest went in the water and the water heaped up when Joshua, in the days of Joshua, or like Moses with the, with the parting of the Red Sea. This kid had the stick going, poof. Oh, we'll cross this river right here on dry ground. Just touching with, with Elijah's staff. But it was the power of God that was operating. I mean, how many, would anybody here like to have power like that? I mean, I, I'm like, this is this kid. Now, this kid grew up in this anointing. By the time we get to this story, he's got a servant that works for him now. And I love this part because at this time, the Syrians, also, also known as the, the people from Aram, that, that's the older name of the same region. Mo most people just know it by Syria today, but just... That region over there, this is um, the, king of, the king of Aram or Syria was warring, it says, against Israel. Nothing's really changed today. But same guys, still fighting. And it says that this is what happened. Verse 8, I'm sorry, 2 Kings 6, 8. It says that the king of Aram was warring against Israel and he, he counseled with his servants saying, in, in such and such place I'll make my camp. And the man of God would then send word to the king of Israel this is what Elijah would do. He would say, don't pa pass by this place. Um, be careful. The, the Armenians are coming down there to ambush you. So the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God had told him, and thus he warned him. And so he guarded himself there more than, 
More than once or twice, this happened. Every time the, the king of Syria makes a plan to, to ambush the Israel king and his, and his men, God sends his servant Elijah in to warn the king of Israel. Now in verse 11, the heart of the king of Aram was enraged over this thing, and he called his servants. He said to them, Will you tell me which one of us is for the king of Israel? Who's a traitor? Can you just picture this? He's getting ticked. Every time I try to plan an ambush, this guy's tipped off. Who's telling him? And one of his servants, how many of you heard this part? One of his servants said, no, king, it's not one of us. We're, we're all for you. But it's this guy, Elisha, the guy with a double anointing. He, he's a prophet in Israel. And he tells the king the very words that you speak in your bedroom. There's no secrets you can tell without him knowing. So, this king of Aram, Syria, he gets his baddest guys. He says, guys, his green berets. By the way, they were known for being brutal. His army was, was people were horrified when these guys would come to war against them. And he says, go and see where this prophet is uh, and that I might send and take him. And it was told him, behold, he's in Dothan. So he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. Now when the attendant, the servant of the man of God, had risen early in the morning, he went out. Behold, there's an army with horses and chariots circling the city. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Elijah, we're in trouble. There's a whole bunch of army guys out here. Verse 16 says, So he, Elijah answered, Don't fear, for those who are with us are more than those that are with them. And then Elisha prayed. He said, Oh, Lord, I pray you would open up the eyes of my servant that he might see. Now, how many of you think Elijah's eyes were already open? You know what happens, right, in the story? He prays and the, and the, and the servant's eyes are opened. And when, when he, I love this. The Lord opened the servant's eyes in verse 17. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Did Elisha see Elijah leave with a chariot of fire? Yeah, get caught up in that torrent, that fire to heaven. And now, what he says, oh Lord, open his eyes so he can see what? Chari you thought it was just a movie title, right? Chariots of Fire. They stole it from here, the good book. There was chariots of fire surrounding all of the army of the, uh, of the Assyrians. He's like, so, <laughs> listen to this. This gets even better. He prays for his servant's eyes to be open, but he's going to pray for something else to happen to the eyes of the other guys, the bad guys. The bad guys are coming, and when they came down to Elisha, Elisha just prayed to the Lord, and he said, Lord, strike this people with blindness, I pray. So he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Now, when I say blindness, this is really interesting. I had a question for you. You, you think this one through. Did he make them blind where they were just groping and couldn't see at all? Or that they couldn't perceive what was in front of them. Let Watch this. This is really interesting. Then Elisha says to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the... This is not the drone you are seeking. This is not the place. Follow me. You know, I mean, the Jedi Mind Master right here. You think that that was Star Wars came up with this? No way. Right here in the Bible. He says... Follow me, I will bring you to the man you seek. And they follow him. Okay. And they bring him to Samaria. Now, I don't know if you know this, but back then Samaria was the capital of Israel. So he brings him to Samaria. And <laughs> Elisha marches him right on in. To the mid <laughs> right into the midst of the city. And, when, well, verse 20 tells us, when they came into Samaria, Elisha said, Oh, Lord, open their eyes that they might see. So they op the Lord opened their eyes and, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel, when he saw them, he says to Elijah, My father, shall I kill him? Shall I kill him? He, I could just see little Sicilian in this guy. He's like, you brought, him, you brought me my enemies. They're going to kill him. Can, can I kill him? Can I kill him? And what does Elisha answer? No. You shall not kill them. Would you kill those, he says, what you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? 
He said, set bread and water before them that they might eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And they ate and they drank and, 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 they, and it says, and after they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and, and they went to their master. And it says that, now, he didn't kill them. He did the very thing what Solomon wrote you're supposed to do. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. He's thirsty, give him to drink. And the king of Israel actually did this in the book of Kings right here in Elijah's day. He fed him, he gave him to drink, and he sent them on their way. But let me show you what the result of that was. It says right here, And the marauding bands of the Syrians did not come again into the land of Israel. Can you imagine they get back to the king of Aram? They're like, we're back. And, and, and the king's like, well, where's the guy? Uh, we left him. What do you mean you left him? I sent you to go get him. Well, king, you know, it's kind of like this. You got some hocus pocus thing he does, and we didn't know it was him. He led us right into the city of the king of Israel, and they had us dead to rights. We were surrounded in their city. Like, I don't know, we were like blind, but then we were not blind. I mean, we don't know. We just, we, all of a sudden, we're in the city. The, their whole army's around us, and they could have killed us. But you know what they did? They fed us. They gave us to drink, and they sent us on our way in peace. Go back there and get the guy. I ain't going back there. I can just see the whole bad Syrian army going, look, we're good at fighting, but not with this kind of you know, power. This is not in our wheelhouse. We don't do this hocus pocus stuff. We ain't going. Even if the king commands them to go back, no. We're not going. <laughs> this is where good, in real, I mean, in, can God do this, by the way? I'm just curious. Can God blind someone to not perceive? Or can he open the eyes so we do perceive? I believe he does this all the time for us when we ask. But see, God is spirit. The Bible says God is spirit, and those that worship him have to worship him in spirit and in truth. You got to just do this. It's a, it's a walk by faith. It's, it really is something that his, God's spirit has us do things. I know as I shared this before, but how do you know some people say, like, when God's telling you to do something? I, I usually know because it's something I would not do of my own, like, you know, when he says, forgive your enemies, I'm like, <clears throat> all right, but that's not, I, I didn't think that one up. Pretty sure. And don't take revenge. Leave room for me. I didn't think that one up either. I was working on something here. Guess I got to forget that. Sweep that under the carpet, okay. I can tell the Lord tells me things. I, I don't know about you. Have any of you experienced this where the Lord's telling you to do something and you're pretty sure it ain't you telling you to do that because you're thinking, I would never do that to them. I ain't blessing them. And we don't think in the ways of the Spirit sometimes and that's why we got to be careful that we walk by the Spirit. Remember Paul earlier said, you walk by the Spirit, you overcome the deeds of the flesh. And he told us the deeds of the flesh. He said they were evident. Immorality and impurity and greed and filthiness, all these things of the flesh. He said, you can overcome all that stuff when you stay in the Spirit. But we got to stay in the Spirit. And these words, what Paul is saying, you know, you can, you can try to love without hypocrisy, but if you lose the big, what, what should I call it, the attitude of, or the bigger kind of perspective, that we're against, we're up against evil in this world. I mean, is it... A, is that a reality of our Christian journey that we actually have to face some evil? And if you're going to love without hypocrisy, you need to adopt this attitude right here. You've got to get this particular perspective that you can never overcome this evil with evil. It won't work. You've got you to follow the example of like Elijah or David. You've got to do good to the enemy. You've got to pray for them. Now, I'll tell you, honestly, this is starting. I can tell God's been working on me a long time, chiseling away at some rough edges. Because when I see the guy who's writing this, his name happens to be Saul. Well, no, not now. It was Saul before. It's now Paul. 
What was Saul doing before he was a preacher? He was a persecutor of the faith. He was an enemy of the gospel. He was killing Christians. He had letters in his hands, authority from the, from the high priest to arrest anyone belonging to this Christian movement, the way. That's what they called the early church, the way. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody gets the Father except through me. And here, Paul is out persecuting, killing Christians. And God goes, love your zeal, but you're misdirected. Back. And oh, what did God do to that guy to get his attention? Anyone remember? Blinded him. For three days. And during the three days, he had a little one-on-one -on -one time. We call this theological, you know, realigning. And who was his mentor? Who spoke to him for those three days? He says, Jesus did. She said, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecuteth me? And he said, uh, who art thou, Lord? That I might serve thee. Quick comeback. Because he's blind as a bat. And the guys around him, they, they can hear this voice. They, it's like a thunder. But they don't get what's going on. And it says, the scripture tells us for the next three days, Jesus showed him all that he would suffer. For his namesake. Welcome to the club, Saul. But we're not going to call you Saul anymore. We'll call you Paul. Saul means desirable, handsome. GQ in Hebrew. For the men. You know, really stunning, good looking. We're going to have to knock you down a notch. We'll call you Paul. means little. And, and, and welcome to the club. Because now I'm going to show you what you're... You made everyone else suffer. Now you're going to see what you're going to suffer. And Saul went on to suffer greatly for the gospel. And here he is writing to the church at Rome and saying, guys, keep the big picture. There's evil that you're going to come against, but you can't overcome it with evil. You have to overcome it with good. And because it's this guy writing this, I got this insight to close with. You know, one of the prayers, sometimes you might have an enemy and you're thinking, man, I hate that enemy. I cannot stand them. I wish that they would, and you, got, you fill in the blank with some bad stuff. And, but I'm going to submit to you a more spiritual prayer that you can maybe try to adopt this week. This is what I do. Like, you know, some of the guys are like, man, I wish we just bombed the, them ISIS guys that are hurting those people and beheading those Christians. And I said, that's a great idea, except I'd rather do one better. They go, what do you mean one better? I'd rather pray that they have the Saul to Paul conversion. The very guys that are killing our Christian brothers right now, beheading them, I pray if they're that zealous for the wrong, that God would just gib-slap them spiritually, blind them if he has to, and open up their eyes to, the, to his son, and that they would be that zealous, just like Saul became zealous for the gospel. Was Saul used for the gospel when he became Paul? How about how many books of this New Testament are written by the hand of Paul. I and mean, we've got 27 books in the New Testament. 12 that are for sure signed by Paul. 13, one, you know, Hebrews. We, there's a lot of debate, but it has a lot of Saul's kind of argument style, but a little bit of Luke, maybe as a collaboration, you know. We don't know until we get to heaven. It's, with, it's on my list. Don't get stressed. But we can at least give him credit for almost half the New Testament. The very guy who was persecuting the faith. Now what if God wants to do some great miracle to some ISIS guy who's killing Christians right now and God wants to change his heart and make him proclaim the gospel to this last generation. Would that be cool? Works for me. So I submit to you when we pray for our enemies, you're the worst ones. Best prayer we can pray. God, save their soul. Save them. Turn them from that wrong. Turn them from whatever hate, whatever hurt they're doing into your light and into your plan. Because, see, my limited understanding used to pray for my enemies. Lord, get them. <laughs> and I mean when I say get them, I mean get them. Like, kill them. Take them out. But what if God has a better plan? I mean, what if, what if the Christian? Do, do you think there were ever any Christians back in the early church praying God would take Saul out? Think about it, really.
He's in the next town over coming toward your town. You just heard that 35 Christians were beheaded or imprisoned or beaten with rods, stoned, rocks thrown to their head, just knocking them unconscious. And, and he's coming toward you. Would any of you be praying, kill him, Lord, before he gets here? How many would have thought of the Lord smite him with blindness and open his eyes up to your son? Save his soul. Take him from persecutor of the faith to proclaimer of the faith. Yeah, do that. And write half the New Testament with him too. Which plan's better anyway? The second one. The one I wouldn't have thought of. But the one I can use today. The very wisdom of this story teaches me, guys, I can't overcome evil with evil. Me killing the guy who's doing evil doesn't take away the evil. It just joins in on it. But me saying, God, you save that person and use them. Redeem their life. That, that just sticks it to Satan. And I don't know about you, but I like the idea of sticking him with a little something because he's stabbed me enough. You know, that little turkey's always trying to prick us with his little, you know, jabs and his little cut downs all that. Let's just get him back. Let's pray with good to happen. Let's pray for good to happen to those who do evil to us. God, bless them. Bless them. Do you get this idea we're supposed to bless our enemy, not curse him? What did Paul say? Bless and curse not. Do not curse. We're not supposed to curse. We weren't made for it. You're not even supposed to curse your spouse when you get mad. Some of you better pay attention here. This is the only part of the sermon is for you. The rest you slept through, but that's okay. I hope you had a nice nap. Oh, my wife said she stayed awake. <laughs> it wasn't for you. Let's do this together. Let's pray for our enemies, especially the enemies of our nation. You know, it's one thing we really, we have on our money. One nation under what? Under God. I, I remember when I met some of my, my grandfather's friends who had come from the old country that they were so impressed, they didn't know. They just thought America must be a great land because on their money said one nation. This, this is when I was a young man. Our money said one nation under God. They thought you must be like the best nation ever. A nation under God. But as a nation under God, do we pray for our enemies to be saved? No, we just go bomb them if they don't agree. I mean, that's what we do sometimes. And there are some bad guys out there. And I won't get started on my Sicilian ways because that's going to ruin the sermon. Instead, I'll tell you, I better do what Jesus would do and pray for them. Pray, let's just pray that they get saved. Seriously, let's pray. Because the devil wins if they don't get saved and they die in their sin. But if they get saved, then God wins. And we overcome evil with, with truly with his good. So let's close with prayer, shall we? Father, thank you so much for the privilege to have your word to instruct us how to deal with our enemies. Lord, help us to bless those that persecute us. Help us to pray for, the, for, for your kindness to come into the lives of those that are, are fighting and striving against us. Lord, I just pray that, I pray that for even in the body of Christ, the ones that strive churches with other churches, that they would just let go of that silliness and be praying for one another. Lord, as, as, as you've instructed us to do, we pray even now, we pray for the other churches in our community, we pray for our president, for our whole nation, Lord. We pray for our enemies of our nation, that you would save them. Please save those ones. They need your hand. Father, we ask that in Jesus' name. And everyone who agree with me amen. said, amen. amen. Would you stand with me? Let's sing a closing song. Send you off in the joy of the Lord. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, amazinggracekona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.